Hello and welcome to a really fun interview episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton and I get to be here today with Catherine Ransom, who is an educator and a Christian leader. She is constantly searching for new challenges like traveling around the world, writing and publishing her first book at age 83, and she does not want to waste one moment of her life in inactivity. She currently lives in Springfield, Illinois. And there she serves as the trustee of the Illinois Symphony Orchestra, the local public television station, and is a former board member at Lincoln Christian University. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to share today. Well, we like to start our interview episodes out with um, with a just for fun question. And lately it's been the same question just because it's really fun to hear everyone's different answers. So what is your favorite prayer closet? Where's the place that you like to go where you feel like you're close to God and enjoy praying? Well, I suppose that the, that closet is lots of places because I'm one that seems to uh, uh, move around a lot and n never really quiet. So it, it can be during night when I wake up in the middle of the night, it can be at a stoplight or while I'm driving, it could be at my computer. But it's amazing how often I just pray spontaneously with people uh, when I see that they have a need. And uh, as opposed to, and we may talk about that a little bit later, but I think it's a, a life of prayer, not moments. And that's probably part of my personality. Well, I think that's wonderful. And I just think that that perspective is, well, we're, we'll definitely get into that later. But I think that perspective is what just, you know, to infuse your entire life with prayer and just see it as a seamless journey and not not like prayer is an activity but that it's it's a lifestyle and i love that about you that's really neat um well we are i, I think we're gonna let's start off and and talk about first of all congratulations on publishing your first book now is it actually available right now it's published and out for the world yes since april and uh Yes, thank you. It's uh, available. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. You can get it at Westbow Press, which is nice because they're the ones that published it. Uh, it's, of course, on Amazon. And uh, I also sell it out of the trunk of my car, but that's not appropriate for most people. <laughs> well, if you live near... well, Some people gonna... accuse me of selling drugs out of my car. But... Just books. Well, and I was going to say, if you live near Spr books. Springfield, Illinois, then maybe it would be okay. But you travel so much, you probably aren't in Springfield all the time to sell those books. <laughs> probably not. But it's one way. But uh, Amazon and West Bowl Press and Barnes & Noble have been very, very gracious. Those three places are wonderful places to buy them. That's great. And your book is Thank called... Thank you for Ransom. asking. Oh, yeah. And your book is called Ransom Notes. And it, this is Catherine Ransom. So, yeah, definitely check it out. Well, how did this book come to be? Tell us a little bit about... Because I know this is... I guess you could say it's a collection of essays, or I, I looked at it as a bunch of devotionals. And it's just... It's so much fun to read. It's full of wisdom. It's full of humor. But how did this book come to be? Because I know you didn't just sit down and write it all at once. It started a long time ago when I started teaching an adult class at church. And I didn't get everything said that I wanted while I was teaching because I'm a word woman of lots of words sometimes. So I started having other things I wanted to share. And I was writing them an essay and I don't know what to call them either. It's really hard to classify the book. But I wrote the little essays or devotionals uh, each week, and I put them on in front of an eight and a half by 11, shared them with the class, and then gradually people wanted to have them share with others, so we started sending them out online. And so I now have, uh, on Sunday afternoon, send it out to about 300 people, uh, which is sort of fun. And then, uh, oh, I was... I really didn't think I was a very good writer, but I began to get some interesting feedback from friends who suggested that perhaps I should think about publishing it, which was really a new thought. 
And then one day I saw something on the internet that talked about self-publishing and I sent them a series of samples. And before you know it, I got this interesting phone call and it said, um, we'd like to talk to you about your book. And before I knew it, I had said yes, and I'd sent them a big check. And so now I have a book after lots of little hurdles. Yeah. So how long was it between the time that you decided to publish the book and actually this last April? What was that time frame? Probably about a year. Uh, it, it actually came out in print on March, the last day of March. So I really think of it as April. And I had first talked to them in March. So it's right at a year. If I think you were to do a second book, some of the hurdles I had would take much less time because I had to learn how to uh, classify my pictures and get them up to 300 DPIs, which I didn't know anything about. Yeah. And I had to have help. And then I would have to have help in editing it. And I had to change everything from pages to Word, if people know about uh, computers. And that was a giant challenge. So we had, some, we had some bumps, but that's okay. Do you have another book in you? Or are you thinking about a second? Well, people ask me that. And of course, I've been writing essays every week that I'm in town since I published the book. So I probably have about a half enough for another book. And if this one goes well and the Lord seems to think it has uh, some potential, I suppose I wouldn't say no to him. I did say I wanted to at the beginning and he shoved me. So maybe he'll shove me again. We'll <laughs> just keep our eyes and our heart open. Well, that's exciting. That is really exciting. Well, tell us, um, so I have a few questions just kind of, based on some topics that I really felt our listeners would benefit from hearing you talk about. We're not going to give the whole book away, but some of the particularly prayer related um, topics I wanted to ask you about. So um, the first one was what I just loved. It's on page 70 of the book. Um, the the chapter's called Just Passing By, and it talks about the Good Samaritan, and you and and the question that you pose is: Do prayers substitute for dirty hands or loss of private time? And I just love that. That kind of cut me to the quick. Um, and this theme comes out several times in your book: the the theme of prayer versus action. So, talk a little bit about that. Can you tell us? Have you struggled with that, or is that something that? that you see as kind of a chronic problem in the church or what are your thoughts? What, what made that important to you? Of course I've struggled with it. I'm human and it's a common thing that it's hard to get the, the right balance. I think one of my biggest concerns and when I read your question, I thought about it that it's so easy to say, I'll pray for you when somebody identifies a need for themselves or for a family or whatever it might be. And out of your mouth, in this day and age, it seems like out pops the words, I'll pray for you. And then I may be the only one that ever, to whom that ever happens, but you say that and then somehow you realize maybe a week, like, I forgot to pray for that person or that particular situation. And I, the more I think about it is that it is a balance. You do, if I, if I pray, I really, if I say I'm going to pray, I need to pray. But sometimes the prayer needs legs and the Lord works through people. Sure, he can do miracles, he can intervene, he could do all of it on his own. But I think he really expects us to be his mouth and his hands. And that's why I say sometimes you have to get your hands dirty, whether it's raking leaves because the church camp needs help and they don't have money to pay for people to come. And so you go out and you put some blood, sweat and tears in raking leaves or whatever it might be. I think there's another aspect to that. It isn't just I that needs to do the work for a prayer. Sometimes it may be that I need to help direct the prayer 
to someone who can do it more efficiently. Some of the, uh, if, if for example, um, somebody is ill, my praying, I can't go in and get my hands dirty taking out the tumor or the cancer, but I can pray for and give even verbal support to a physician whom I might know since I've been in the city a long time, and I might go to the hospital, and yes, that's one way I can add legs to my prayer, but sometimes it's somebody else, or it needs lots of hands, and so then I'll get my whole class engaged. Or the, the statement that I think I need to share here is that friends in my class and friends who know me say, don't ever look Catherine right in the eyes because she'll have a job for you. And part <laughs> of that is not that I want to put them to work, but I can't do everything. The Lord, I just don't have ability or talent and or time. So it's a combination. And I think indeed that the church does need believing prayer, prayers, if there's that, such a word, but they also need believing workers. And so we tried to uh, do a combination. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I just, I love the fact that, you know, it seems like he, they're within the church and, and just within the, the body of Christ in general, it seems like there are certain people that are gifted with seeing the needs and orchestrating the others to fill those needs. And it sounds like you're one of those people. I'd share a couple of stories if I might. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, a part of my philosophy is built on, I had one brother who's younger than, who was younger than I am and is no longer around. But when he was growing up, he had a statement when uh, somebody would offer to try and help him do something, own self do it. And I think that that own self doing it is again, part of my philosophy. Own self can't do everything and we need to share. But I think there's another piece of, I, I really believe in spontaneous prayer. In replacing the phrase, I'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. I've tried to wherever possible, and it's not always the right way to say, let's stop and pray right now. And, or may I pray with you? And whether I'm in the hospital, which is a logical place and lots of people do that. But I'm just as likely to do it with a phone call. Uh, yesterday, a friend emailed me and wanted me to call. I returned the call and realized she had been just diagnosed with cancer. We had a prayer on the phone. Yes, I prayed later, but part of it is share that prayer because I think in the process, you help support them. I cite another example because sometimes praying out loud spontaneously has just a little bit of fright to it. You don't want to embarrass the person, so I always ask if we may. It might just be embarrassing in the situation. Recently, I was down at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri, and I was taking a tour. I had gone to school there for a couple of years when I was first out of high school, so I was renewing friendships. I went into the library, which was new, and as I always do, I usually say hi because I'm not very bashful, as you probably have already guessed. <laughs> and uh, the, young man, the young man at the desk uh, was there and I said hi to him. And then I usually follow up with something and, you know, really original, like, how's your day going? And, uh, and then I looked at him and I said, but your eyes tell me that you're sort of sad today. And he shared part of his story, not very much, but enough. I said, could we just have a prayer? And right there in the library, we sort of, I sort of touched his hand and we prayed. And um, I, I think we touched his heart. I'd love to be closer to Joplin and drop in and have a cup of coffee again with him and share. But um, Sometimes it's amazing, even to a total stranger, how a prayer can maybe lift their heart. If nothing else, it makes your heart feel better. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm certain that it transformed his day. Um, have, in doing that, have you ever had an experience where 
people have said, no, I don't want to pray with you or that you've prayed and then it's been received negatively? At my age, I sometimes forget things, but to my knowledge, I'm a reasonably decent um, perceiver that I, I'm pretty good at knowing where this is probably all right to pray. Right. I would not have done this if there had, with a young man, for example, I would not have done that if there had been people at the desk right at the moment, mm -hmm. or if it had been really crowded, unless we could have done it very, very silently. I sort of, I sort of know. Um, I guess I did have one hospital experience where the, the, the man in the, in the hospital bed was so ill and his wife really didn't want any conversation in the room. And so I graciously left, but that is really, really rare. Yeah. And I've, I've found that it surprises me the times where I really don't think someone would necessarily be receptive, but God prompts me to ask someone to pray. And I, I can't, really think of too many times when people have not been open to that because I think when people are in need and you perceive that and especially like you said I think it's so important to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading and to your surroundings and and to you know all of the things that work together to make it a better situation but yeah I I've been surprised at the receptiveness of people when they're in need to prayer like on the spot <laughs> sometimes Sometimes it's even nice in some situation. I, I will say, let's each of us pray mm -hmm. uh, where I think it's uh, a problem and or I think that they would feel comfortable praying. Uh, the majority of the time when I do that, I don't dare put them on the spot. Uh, there's always a little pause if they wanted to it'd be easy enough to do. When I visit a friend in the, our local jail right now, uh, we will include our uh, conclude our 25 minute face to face conversation and we always leave time to pray and he and i each pray i know he likes to i know he feels comfortable doing it i think it's a way for him to grow so we both do but most of the time uh, i leave it to the person's uh, option if they care to to do that well i was wondering what what do you see as kind of an ideal balance in the day-to-day -day of this kind of prayer and action and not even i, I think i'm going to go even different not even prayer and action um i want to go back to this do prayers substitute for dirty hands or loss of private time how do we balance um the physical things because prayer is something we can obviously do in our home in between the busy life stuff um, or in your car, you can, you can work that into your schedule. But in today's super busy and at least perceived super busy lifestyle, I think just about everyone would say they're busy. Um, what would you say is the balance? Because on one hand, for me personally, what I struggle with is the idea that I want to be a doer. And in the past, I've been a doer at the expense of things that need to be done at home or my own family, not necessarily private time, but time for my family. But in your book, you even mentioned that one of the lies that we can believe is my family's too demanding or too busy for me to be able to do anything outward. And that is a lie. So how do we, how do we discern that? What would you, what advice would you give to people on the, what that balance might look like between personal responsibility or home or even downtime or private, <clears throat> excuse me, private time, and then doing those acts of service that, that can't be replaced by prayer alone. Um, the, the, the balance is going to change and be different for every person because uh, being single, you have some more flexibility in your time, for one thing. Being retired, you have more time. Uh, you don't have to report at eight every morning for a job or whatever your starting time is. I think, though, it is keeping your eyes and your heart open for opportunities. Where can my, for example, 
if, if I know someone is hurting or need and I need to go to the hospital, maybe it's that, oh, kids, let's go and have a hamburger and let's go up and see so-and-so at the hospital together. And we teach our kids that uh, visiting somebody who's lonely or uh, it's shut in or whatever it might be. Or we know that uh, work needs to be done out at the camp. I, I mentioned camp because I'm really involved with our church camp. Uh, let's, let's spend Saturday morning. Let's hurry and all pitch in and do the work at home so we can zip out and have fun and they're going to have food and let's grab our rakes and go. And so I see two or three families come out and together the little kids, and some of them don't rake very many leaves, but they're out there and they're learning that it's great to share your energies and you're helping the kingdom. Uh, you just have to, I think part of it is you have to in your heart think it's important that you put legs to the prayer and that sometimes the dirty may just mean um, cooking an extra uh, dish full of soup and say kids uh, one of the teenagers loves to drive would you mind driving an extra time I know you've just gotten your license but could you take <laughs> this bowl of soup in this container over to so and so and uh, you'd sure help me out hon if you do it she gets to drive she learns that it's great to share. It didn't take much time, more time to make one extra bowl of soup that you were doing for the family, and you help somebody who is either just needs to know somebody cares or who actually is needing some help with food. And I only make that example up to try and illustrate what I'm oh. saying. I love that. That's great. That's a win, win, win. The, the driver's license one, that was sneaky. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want you to tell us about your first New Year's resolution in 2018. I resonated with this because I, I wrote a blog post a year or so ago about why I didn't like New Year's resolutions until, you know, a couple of years ago. But tell us about your first New Year's resolution. Well, I, 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 I guess I really should have uh, gone back and really reread that one. As oh, I'm sorry. At the, uh, <laughs> no, I'll let you. It was, what I'm thinking about. Yeah, it was uh, your New Year's resolution was to pray more. And, and then you kind of in that article expounded on, on some of the different things that you had learned as you were exploring prayer, you know, praying more in your day to day. Well, uh, yeah, and part of the resolution is that, that, that you need to, to think about, what to put aside time. I think that right about that 2018 was the time also that uh, I was facing major knee surgery, two knee replacements, and uh, I needed to pray pretty specifically for uh, uh, losing weight, for one thing, uh, and I did lose, and I have lost about uh, 35 pounds in the last year and a half or so, which is good for lots of reasons. But it had to come with some some prayer and some action, and that meant going to the uh, fit club and not having as many Dairy Queens as and uh, we call them horseshoes here in town. But it's a a special cheese dish with hamburger and toast and fries and full of calories so you know you had to sort of substitute but it was also that i needed to have faith in um and trust in the surgeon i don't care whenever you go under the knife and even though i'd had uh, uh and it sort of expands over the whole year i certainly had marvelous uh recovery time with the first knee i still was really frightened with the second one uh you uh, trust your doctor but you know that at any time, a knife can slip. Uh, they thought that had happened with my first one and that they had cut a nerve and we were afraid that I would have drop foot. Um, if you don't think that brings um, fear in the heart of a lady who loves being active, playing golf, not sitting still, uh, that thought, I would have survived. I would have learned how to accommodate, but it would certainly have changed my lifestyle. Uh, so as I faced the second one, again, I, I really had to become active in prayer. And uh, the Lord was, again, blessed. The doctors worked hard. And uh, 
I, I recovered very quickly and uh, I, I'm very fortunate for that. But I also, in, in this whole period of time, uh, the president of Lincoln Christian College, Dr. Don Green, um, sent out a letter, and I never remember exactly the, the total words that he used because I'm not good at remembering details. That's one of my downsides. But the, pro, the, pro, the proposition was that we need to be bold when we pray. Uh, we need to be specific. We need to be believing that it really can happen, that it needs to be spirit focused. It needs to not just be, oh Lord, I'd love to have uh, um, uh, a, a, new, a new whatever, a new car, a new trip, a new whatever. I wish our house was happier and was more beautiful. Would you, you know, buy us a new boat, Lord? Uh, those are not very spirit filled. There's nothing wrong with any of those desires. But that's probably not the real person, a real place of, of prayer. So it needs to be spirit filled and it needs to be repeated. It needs to be frequent. Um, he says, go into your closet and pray. And I think the closet is the world. Uh, I, I don't take closet literally. Um, for one, I'd have trouble getting inside of my closet. It's reasonably <laughs> small. And so I, th I think it's more a spiritual kind of thing. And that's why I think I can do it just as, I pray just as well in the car as I can wherever I might be on the boat or whatever it could be. So I have tried to share that, uh, those, those points that Don made uh, to, uh, to pray very specifically, not, not just help the camp out with uh, finances. God, we have a, a debt that needs to be prayed for, and that needs to be paid off. And I, I think you talked or, or read the story when we were getting down near to paying for the new building on the campgrounds. And we, it was, it cost a little over a million and the board of which I was not on, but the board really didn't want to borrow money. And yet it strung out and we needed to get that building open because it was also not only a meeting place, but it was the new boys dorm. And the old boys dorm was really not a place to put young men in. It was just too old. It was one of the first buildings. And so they were, we had to take out a small loan. And it was coming time to really pay it. And we owed about $150,000, which is not sneeze money. And some of us really started to implement Don's um, proposition that we should believe frequent, specific, Christ-filled, spirit-filled, uh, and do it often with many people. And we had a team that were praying for that very thing. And a few days after we had had that prayer, and we were getting very close to the deadline, Kerma, the person who is our camp manager, called me and she said, Catherine, you better sit down. <coughs> Excuse me. And she told me that we had gotten a information about a check that was coming and you wouldn't believe it but we needed 150,000 and the person had sold some stock and it was for the amount of $148,000 if you don't think that isn't a god answered prayer you got a problem yeah um, oh and i we love that story the rest of the money that off it was just we had a second prayer at the same campground that's on a much smaller scale but equally supporting that god does listen uh, the camp never has too much money they always have to be careful we have very very responsible people that direct our camp but having said that they needed gravel for the road it was getting really bad and kerma and the other person that really helps her, Gail, the two of them are really in charge. Gail and, and Kerma were, they got the bill and they were looking at the estimate to have the, the roads into the camp with gravel. And the estimate was for, a, 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 excuse the phone, I can't turn it off. It'll just, it won't rain forever. No the problem. estimate was for 28,000, okay, for $28,000. 
and they looked at each other and they said, we don't have $28,000, what are we going to do? And Kerma got up and walked back to her office. She looked at the telephone book and she randomly chose a place in our city that supplies gravel, dialed it, got the man on the phone, explained what she needed, that she was out at Lake Springfield Christian Assembly and that we needed so much. And she said, what, what would be your bid or your estimate of what it would cost? And before he answered, he said, is this where Gail works? Is this the Gail I knew? And they had gone to school together or church together, and they had known each other for a long time, but he had, they had lost track of each other. He said, um, let me go see what I can do. And he came back a few moments later, and he said, uh, I think we can do it for $10,000. So as opposed to 28000 the first bid, Wow. 10,000 and 10,000 they could hand. We know that prayer, as the two of them prayed, we know that it had a part in connecting Kerma with the right contractor to supply that. We just don't believe. But I think the other thing that really worries me about prayer, maybe this isn't the place to say it, but I think the other thing that distresses me is that I'm great at praying. Well, I don't know. I'm decent at praying. I'm very specific. I encourage other to pray. I try to put legs on the prayer. And then good things happen. And what happens to me? I forget to say, God, I really thank you. Yeah. What I do is that I start on another list of things I want him to do. <laughs> and I need to do that. But I also need to say, I'm grateful, God. It's marvelous that you answered our prayer and acknowledge that and share that acknowledgement with those with whom I'm prayed, that, that I prayed with, because they too need to say, acknowledge, we know God, you had a part in this answer. It's like you try to teach your kids to say thank you when somebody does something good for you. Yeah. And it's a hard task to learn. And sometimes we're children in the art of praying. And we need to remind them that children need to say thank you and adults need to say thank you. Right. Just a crazy side bar. No, I totally agree with you. And for me, it kind of goes a step further where I'll see this, um, you know, I'm like the Israelites in the desert. I see a miracle and then I promptly forget and grumble. <laughs> yes, yes. So, I, yeah, I think it is so important to be thankful and and to share, like, I think that's another really great part is not to keep that miracle or huge answer to prayer to yourself, but like you, you know, you share in this book and just reading that story about God's provision for that camp was so encouraging to me and share, you know, you might not be an author and be able to write a book about it or, you know, but you can tell people and remind them of of what God has done, like setting up that Ebenezer stone, you know, reminding others, hey, God did this amazing thing and he's capable of doing even greater things. And yeah, I think that's really important. And I also loved your honesty because- You asked- Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you, you sort of asked what struggles and so forth and, yes. uh, and what am I trying to do to help? And, and I think- I need to be reminded, and I'm trying to remind myself more, that I need to read scripture and let that lead me into some needs for prayer. That The scripture won't tell me to pray for my friend who just has been acknowledged with cancer, but there certainly are passages of scripture that indeed uh, open up a congregation so that they'll understand God's word, that they'll be receptive. There's many prayers, and that... Uh, I, a phrase came into my mind as I was sort of typing up some responses and thoughts to your questions is that I need to have sore knees as well as dirty hands that I need to pray, but I also need to get my hands dirty. And I suppose I focus on knees since I have two new metal knees, but uh, yeah, you got to get some good get use on. out of them. <laughs> yes. I used them this morning. We were putting on the cover to the boat and uh, to uh, fasten it, I had to get down on the deck on my knees and I have to do that very slowly because the metal sort of screams sometimes when it's, uh, it, the metal knees do not work like God's knees. 
no, they're not a not a total substitute for the for the real deal. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, so you talked about another another really neat just idea that I think is really practical for for me. It was it it really convicted me about just my own prayer life for our church. But you talk about um, an article by Kim Butts from Harvest Prayer Ministries in 2014, and you kind of expound on that article, and it's called The Prayer Bubble. Can you tell us about that idea and what that is and how, how we can implement that in our own churches? Uh, when I read the article about The Prayer Bubble, it, it really, um, uh, it, I really got excited about it. For, for a couple of reasons. One, it's the idea that uh, prior to, it's particularly focused in that article on the, the Sunday service, when people generally come together and worship and share and the, and the church comes together because the building is not the church, we are the church. So when the church assembles inside a building on that Sunday and has, and so they divided up people into small groups with leaders and they had different tasks prayer tasks to do. For example, and I can't list all of them, but one of them was, uh, which was really one of the tough ones, I'm confident, is that they had a team, and it must have been a relatively small church in the example, but people on that team were to pray for every single individual by name. Remember Don Green said we need to be specific by name, that they would come together as a congregation and that their lives would be blessed because that uh, of the service and the singing and the communion and the prayer. They had a, a committee that prayed just for the people who were out directing traffic out uh, on the parking lot and helping people out of the car who might be on walkers or whatever it might be. There was a team that prayed for the, uh, the custodial staff and those who prepared the building for the worship service, that things would be right, that the microphone would be turned on and the videos would be working appropriately. For the group that would be on the stage, whether it was for music or it was the minister that was um, preaching or whatever it might be. So they, they looked at the congregation, and they looked at what happened on Sunday morning. They looked about, they also had a team, I believe, that prayed for people who didn't come, that their hearts would uh, uh, be blessed, that uh, they would look at themselves and perhaps say, oh my goodness, I didn't get fed this week, so to speak, spiritually, and uh, uh, please come again. I know I find that when people don't come to class, I, I try to, as many of them, email them the next day and say, we missed them, you need to come back, you need to touch base. So they tried to put the whole service in a bubble of prayer. They even had one team who prayed during the service that all things would go with a blessing and that people would att be attentive, that they would apply, that they'd make connections and that they would be fed and that they would be charged up and ready to go out. Uh, that sort of gives you a, perhaps a little bit of an idea of a prayer bubble. Now, I must say, after you reminded me of that, after you talked about that particular story or essay, I realized that I thought it was a great idea. I'm not in charge of the whole things that happen at our church at Southside, so I knew I couldn't implement that immediately for our church. And I thought, you stupid lady, you can implement it with your own class. So I am now drafted up and have it... Uh, uh, a, a plan to put legs on that particular idea. I'm working with the uh, minister on our staff who helps with uh, educational programs where he may even want to put more legs on it than I know how to help, but that's okay. The Lord, if he wants it expanded bigger, but I think Southside may find where I go to church, we may find that, uh, we may have some form that is adapted to our situation of the prayer bubble. I think it has great potential. And I thank you for reminding me I needed to get off my behind and try and implement that. 
Yeah, it, it sounds like you haven't been doing a whole lot of sitting around though, Catherine. <laughs> I think you're good. <laughs> so, well, so I, I definitely read that and I was, I've been feeling led to do some kind of prayer ministry. I led a Bible study last, uh, last year on prayer through our church, but I, I just felt God kind of calling me to do more of a direct prayer ministry, not talking about prayer or learning about prayer, but like directly something like you're talking about. And I read that and I thought, oh, okay, got to, got to do it. So I took the first steps and, and I appreciate your encouragement with that because I took the first steps to get that ball rolling. And it turned out when I approached our women's ministry leader about it, I said, you know, God's been just kind of putting the bug in my ear for a long time that I need to do this. And I read this book and it kind of stirred this up. And she said, I just literally wrote down on my list of things for women's ministry, prayer team. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That shows how the Lord works together. Your prayer bubble could be as you're having some of these interviews that you have a, a group that they know when you're going to have that and uh, an interview and they work with pray uh, somebody it might not be teams it might be individuals that have one responsibility just come on at uh, at 12 30 because that's the time here uh, it, come on and someone is just praying that the tech team uh does not have a breakdown that number two that uh, the person who's being interviewed doesn't get too frightened and and is able to express themselves and that you have the ability to remember wonderful questions that you wrote but that you can articulate them so that your uh guests can understand them there, there's got to be a number of probably four or five and if you had four or five people pray either just before or while you're doing an interview uh that might be also another way to use prayer. Oh, that is a great idea. And we already have that infrastructure. We have a private Facebook group, the Praying Christian Women community that, that we could and have in the past just said, hey, we're doing an interview or we're doing something, but that's not a regular thing. So that would be a great idea to put that there and say, this is when we're doing an interview and we need prayer for this and this and this. I love that idea. Well, let's see. Oh, okay. This is my last question before we talk about your, just where people can find your book and how to pray for you. But if you could go back to your 20 something self and give her one piece of advice, what would it be? I really thought a long time about that question. And I think it has to be somehow somebody should have helped me realize that I had to develop trust and faith that things that were happening while I was 20 are only stepping stones to where maybe you ultimately want to be. Hmm. And I shared this uh, with uh, someone that, that I spoke with even just this morning. And I used the illustration of Moses. And at 80, which is similar to where I am now, he had the job to take the children of Israel into the across the wilderness and up to the edge of the of the promised land 80 years he had to do and go through lots of things that were good and bad including the murder of of, of, a, of someone he had the opportunity to live in the kings or the palace where he learned how to uh, even if he didn't realize it he learned how to uh, uh, respond and relate to people of power but he also had to live as a shepherd for a while to learn how to live in the desert to be humble so as i think about my own life and i had some real challenges in college and i got discouraged and when i was ready to go to my third year of college and i was switching to a state university and i was changing my career and I had to start as the freshman again and I took the exams to get in and when I was going to the counselor to find out the results of those and after his conversation about it I said but you know really tell me what my IQ was and so forth and he looked at me after a moment and he said with your IQ 
you will never get through college. And that is probably as discouraging as when Moses maybe shot somebody or killed somebody. I've only shot him. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to work around that. Um, at that time, I think I didn't realize that probably discouragement was good for me. It made me say, because I'm a stubborn little old lady, it made me, it made me know that, um, boy, I'm going to try the very best I can. And yes, I, I probably am not going to be a physicist or I'm not going to be a heart surgeon, but I'm going to take advantage of whatever steps and I'll keep trying and going. And yes, I am managed to get, and I would love to go back to that counselor and say, and yes, I even managed to go to the University of Illinois and get my master's degree in counseling, but that's okay. Probably, you know, we just misunderstood what my score was. So the, the, I think the thing I would like to say to 20 year olds, accept where you are, live the best that you can, take advantage of it, but for heaven's sakes, keep moving on and don't let this hurdle keep you from keeping hurdling on. And you could use the analogy of people who do the hurdles. I can't even imagine how they run hurdles, but they do. And each time that barrier comes up, they have to exert more energy to get up over it. And I think those hurdles, those are physical hurdles, but I think we have spiritual and actions and attitude hurdles that are probably just as difficult to hop over as those that are a true uh, athlete gets over. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. And I think this is great advice, no matter 20 something, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 something, you know, that's, it's constantly, God is building, he's building and building and, and where you're struggling now is serving a purpose, you know, no pain is wasted. No struggle is lost on God. You know, he's in it all. And I love that. I love that. Thank you. Um, were there any other things that we didn't get to that you wanted to share? I knew you had some prayer anecdotes. Did we get through all of the ones that you wanted to share or did you have anything else about the book or anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? I think you've been a, a wonderful, I, I wish I had the ability to develop questions as nicely as you do. So, Oh my uh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was great. And well, I, I appreciate, I really do appreciate um, this first time opportunity to do something like this. Um, oh. I never used Zoom. I, I need to share this with you, though. Uh, Zoom was new to me. I had Skype, not, I hadn't initiated it, but I had done Skype a couple of times when you were at somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And so Zooming was, uh, I Zoom in, I, 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 the other day I wrote an essay on because I'd had a chance to uh, drive a Z4 BMW that was just for a few moments and I zoomed illegally a little bit. We won't tell anybody <laughs> that I did that. And so I do zoom, but I was at Lincoln Christian college yesterday and um, talking with some of the staff and the, uh, the president and the one of the vice presidents. And I shared with them that I was just about ready to do a new experience with zoom and that, they had taught me how to do it and downloaded it. And then I'd gone on and investigated and I'd read some of the testimonies by other colleges who were already using Zoom. And that as Lincoln Christian College or University is beginning to have to do more and more uh, online courses. I said, I think Zoom is really uh, the medium that we need to begin to investigate. And blessings, I, and I should have known this, they said, the vice president said, I have just finished taking a course by Zoom online. We are setting up a room at the college, a classroom where we can do it. And I should have known that they were brighter than I am and that they'd already thought of it. But it was fun to go talk to them because then I could support, uh, they know I've been in education and I could support their efforts. But that's thanks to you uh, for uh, introducing me to Zoom Zoom. And uh, I, I think it, it was easy. One of the comments that the people uh, who gave the testimony said it's an easy uh, method, and it certainly is. I mean, I just clickety-click and on we are, and uh, people like me need it simple. Yeah, well, 
I'm I'm thinking so Alana and I use Zoom. My co-host of the podcast who founded Praying Christian Women is Alana Terry and um we don't live we both live in Alaska but we live in different towns and so whenever we do the podcast we use Zoom meeting. We don't ever we've never filmed or recorded the podcast in the same place at the same time. And so we've been using it for a while, but I don't know, Catherine, I think there, there must be some, there has to be a finder's fee or something <laughs> for, you, yeah, that's a thought. for you to do, uh, for you to, to have brought that to the attention of the university, even though they already had been going in that direction. I think, I think Zoom owes you like for that free advertising. <laughs> well, I just thank you for, uh, broadening my array of knowledge. Well, I just, I loved having you here and you're just, you are an inspiration with just all of the things that you're doing. And um, we just wish you so much success with the launch of this book. And I hope more to come after this. Um, where, so you've already told us where listeners can find your book. Do you have a website also that they can connect with you or Facebook or anything online? Yes. And I, I, I always get confused with what, what numbers and letters go together. But <laughs> something is www.catherineransom.com. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's either Facebook or the website. And then there's something, I know it's crazy. It's and, then there, and then there's something that is HTTPS slash colon slash slash uh, www and I think it's Facebook dot and then it's ransom notes book okay slash so, so there is a website there's theoretically a blog but I have still difficulty getting on to respond I, I'm much better at putting new stuff on Facebook and uh, uh, so I put so I, I tend to put sort of silly things on um, because I'm just a goofy old lady. Well, I love that. In your essays, you you just have such a great sense of humor and mix it in with the serious and the wisdom in such a nice way. I hope everybody will check out your book. And it, so it sounds like Ransom Notes book is your Facebook page. And then it sounds like katherineransom.com. And it's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, right? Right. Catherine and then Ransom, Ransom is like kidnapped. Just like kidnapped. So, okay, perfect. Well, I hope a lot of people will go check out your website and join you on Facebook and get your book. Um, before we leave, we would love to pray for you on the air. So what? how can we be praying for you today? Um, one is selfish and one is for others. Um, selfishly, I wish people would pray that through this book, I can let the Lord's light shine mm -hmm. and that it will be used as much as possible to help spread the kingdom. Um, that uh, it's so hard in this day and age to get information out about uh, a, a, a book. It really does take social media. I'm really having to work very hard to learn how to use it easily so that it isn't so time consuming um, so I pray that people will help me learn swiftly, that through it, minds will be open and that uh, hearts will be blessed, but most importantly, that they'll be drawn closer to Christ. And the second, using Don Green's model, uh, we have a debt on another piece of land for the church camp. We really need, it's, it's the perfect addition for the camp to introduce some uh, new aspects for uh, youth and adults to appreciate God's world that he created because it has a cypress swamp on the end of it. It's on the, the lake and it has a wooded area. So it's a great new spot. But we need to have raise $68,000, hopefully by the end of 2019. I would wish that we could have a whole group of people who would help pray specifically that the hearts would be touched in one or several or many people to uh, help us uh, get that final amount that we need. It, it's certainly possible with the Lord. 
and uh, but I need the Lord likes to have lots of people focus on the same task. It certainly is a spiritual uh, kingdom building uh, uh, goal. I'm asking in a bold, believing kind of way. And that's called Eagle Lodge. Is that what that camp is called? Oh, that's Cypress Point. Eagle oh, Lodge is paid for. Okay, this, so Cypress Point. This, well, this is this is another edition. I know we keep, you know, but you have to keep growing as you. Well, have I to. wanted to be specific in my prayer, so I wanted <laughs> I wanted to make Cypress, sure. Cypress Point. Okay, Cypress Point. All right, Catherine. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. And thank you again so much for being here with us today. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Father, we just come before you today so thankful for this time to talk about Catherine's book, about prayer, and just about the lessons that, that she has learned and, and that she just wants to share with the world. We lift this book up to you, God. We know that you're in it. We know that you've been behind it, and, and we just pray that you would launch it forward, that you would open doors for it to reach more and more people. God, that any barriers keeping it from going out into the world and, and being seen would be brought down in Jesus' name, that you would just lift it up and let your, let your light shine on it, let your word go out to others. I just, I pray for salvations. I pray for encouragement for believers through this book. Lord, I just pray that Catherine would find uh, more avenues to, to get, get the word out and that you would um, just give her clarity and focus with just the craziness of social media and and all of the the mucking through the details of how to how to navigate it god just help her to see clearly the places that she needs to be the places she needs to be putting it out there and um we just pray that you would be glorified in it god i pray that she would be encouraged as she sees you walking before her and and opening those doors and giving her favor and um we just pray your blessing on this book, God. I pray that you would continue to give her new and fresh ideas as she continues with more essays and devotionals. And we just pray for more to come, God, that you would continue her writing career and just be glorified through it. Um, Lord, I just lift up Cypress Creek, Cypress Point. And Lord, Cypress we just... Thank you. Cypress Point. Um, we lift up Cypress Point to you, God. We just ask that you would um, just make a way for the, these funds to come in to the church to be able to fund this addition to the camp. God, we thank you so much. And we just look back on the truly miraculous and specific ways that you answered the previous prayers um, for the expansion of the camp. And we know that you're faithful to provide, God. We just pray that you would. Do this in a way that makes it clear that it is you behind it. We pray that you would prompt people to contribute financially. We pray that you would prompt people to be prayer warriors, to fight that spiritual battle that's going on. And we just ask that, um, that this camp would be a place that would just expand, that would allow for people to be ministered to in amazing ways. And we just thank you so much, God. And I thank you for Catherine, Lord, and for the, the special burden that you have placed on her life to pray for this camp, to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, Lord, and just for the messages that she shared with us today. And I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds to, to whatever it is that you had for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.